Today, pop goes the mortgage rate. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Well, this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, we know that central banks are lifting rates and seem willing to wear a fall in stock markets and bond prices. But what about the property market? The question is now emerging. Are they willing to see that correct too? Well, so far as the US is concerned, Last Friday was an important day in the history of finance because with the strong CPI figures, which by the way we discussed in our post yesterday, both the headline and the core CPI readings were higher than markets were expecting. And neither stocks nor bonds enjoyed that news. In fact, it changed the bond market's view of the Fed's trajectory higher and quicker. But it also broke the mortgage-backed securities market in the US. In bond jargon, MBS went no bid. In other words, there were no buyers for mortgage-backed security issuers. Then came just a few posting prices well beyond borrow demand, but not wanting to buy except at penalty prices. So overnight, the retail consequence of this was a leap from roughly 5.5% to 6%, for the low fee 30 year fixed mortgage loan. Now that signals a potential full stop to housing finance, and it can make a huge dent ahead in the housing market. Now, of course, stocks were down 2 to 3% on the day, but this event, I think, is even more mega. This is about liquidity. And in fact, I've already been talking in other posts about liquidity drying up. In fact, bond issuance is down. And the truth of the matter is that if banks are not able or willing to get funding from the mortgage-backed security sector, particularly in the US, they will not be able to lend or want to lend. And by the way, I think that stocks will be down a lot more than they were last Friday if the potential freeze in the housing growth was factored in. But you see, what happens is that the MBS sector is a little market over there and not many people necessarily look at it. Now, there was good analysis on this subject over at Mortgage Daily News. There, Matthew Graham wrote, 2022 has already had its fair share of bad news for mortgage rates, but this week was not to be outdone. It began as just another reasonably bad week with rates moving moderately higher, but still safely under the recent 13-year high seen on the morning of May the 9th. But it ended with one of the worst days on record in more than a decade. And he went on to say, does that sound a little dramatic? Well, sadly, it was. The average lender increased 30-year fixed rates by at least a quarter of a point, 0.25%. That's only happened four other times since the daily records that they kept which began in 2009, and three of those were during the one-in-a-lifetime volatility that followed the onset of the pandemic. That made this the fourth worst week since 2009 as well. Now, when the smoke cleared, the average conforming 30-year fixed rate was as high as it's been since November 2008. And if that line looks a little steep recently, that's because with barely half of it in the books, 2022 has been the worst year for rates since 1979. One of the reasons markets were so affected is the recent buzz about inflation showing signs that it might be levelling off. That buzz was responsible for rates having several solid weeks in May. Inflation, of course, is a key driver of interest rates. But after European inflation set a record on May the 31st, rates changed course abruptly. The trend was actually fairly linear over the past two weeks before Friday took things to the next level. And it's worth noting that the 10-year Treasury yield is a preferred benchmark for longer-term rates in general. But one other interesting question is why would the two-year Treasuries take the news harder than the 10-year? Well, it's simply this. The most basic rate in all the land is the Fed funds rate set by the Federal Reserve. It applies to the shortest term loans with time frames less than one day. Because a two-year Treasury is much closer to the Fed funds rate 
than the 10-year Treasury, twos feel it more when Fed funds rate expectations change, and change they did. There are actually financial contracts that track the market's expectations for the Fed funds rate, the Fed funds futures to be exact. Like other rates, they began to level off in May as hopes swelled that inflation was falling into line. Like other rates, they began to move back up in June, but Friday saw some of the biggest single-day movements in Fed funds futures with an entire quarter of point change in just a matter of hours. Incidentally, mortgages have inherently shorter average lifespans than 10 years. Even though 30-year mortgages may be common, people tend to sell or refinance long before the end of the 30 years. Lifespan expectations for mortgages are especially short right now because it's expected that rates will move down enough to motivate refinancing demand at some point in the next few years. So as such, mortgage rates are behaving like bonds that are also closer to the Fed funds rate than 10-year treasuries. Combine that with a generally less friendly stance from the Fed on its mortgage holdings and the underperformance of the mortgage market has been quite pronounced in 2022. Markets are going to be interested to see what the Fed has to say about the future path of rate hikes when they meet on Wednesday. It'll be a very significant meeting, of course, because it's one of the four meetings a year when the Fed also releases updated economic projections. And those include the popular dot plot, which the Fed uses to visually represent where each Fed member expects to see the Fed funds rate in the next few years. And while the Fed has repeatedly told the market not to read too much into the dots, the market never listens. With CPI coming in hot this week, markets can't help but imagine some of those dots are going to drift higher than they otherwise would have. In that sense, Friday was merely the market's way of getting in position for Wednesday's potentially bad news. Mortgage rates were one of the many casualties, but they did take extra damage because the Fed is considering selling some of its mortgage holdings at some point. And while they've promised that that's a way off and that they'll give ample warning, big surges in inflation could move that warning higher on the Fed's to-do list. So this is a very significant point in the current cycle. And if indeed it is true that mortgage rates continue to rise higher, of course they're going to rise in other countries too, and including in Australia. And if the Fed takes rates higher still, liquidity is going to get even more difficult to get hold of, at least at reasonable prices. And that's going to put the price of everything up. Bonds will cost more, which means that corporate funding will be more expensive. Central banks will have to think about their portfolios perhaps differently. And governments, who of course have borrowed big, will have to expect the cost of that borrowing to rise significantly. But more directly, this spells doom and gloom for property, certainly in the US and indeed elsewhere as well. And considering the massive run-up that we've had and the surge in mortgage lending recently, the reversal could well be very profound, which takes me back to where I came to this discussion. Is it possible that central banks will trim their strategy to fight inflation in the light of a falling housing market. Now, as I discussed the other day, Ian McFarlane, ex-RBA chief in Australia, said that the central bank mustn't take account of those marginal buyers. In other words, some of those will be pushed under the bus as rates go higher. I suspect the Fed will think the same, at least for now. Like I said, last Friday was a very significant point in the journey. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.